Yeah, uh, we choose to do this show. We choose to do this show this evening, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept. One we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. And that, my friends, is the most ostentatious intro you will ever get for the Mythwits. The show and dedicated... <laughs> the show dedicated... <laughs> To all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity and coated with sarcasm, every week we bring on an industry guest uh, to talk about the ever-expanding Geekiverse and to play a game, but we're not going to play a game tonight because we're going to focus on the material at hand because we've got some fantastic material. Uh, we do our darndest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I'm your host, Peter Bryant, and I am joined this week by my co-host, Mike Kafis. Uh, It's full of stars. My God, it's full of stars. <laughs> and oh, our guest... That- our guest this week is Jack Clemens. Hey, Jack. Hello, Welcome. guys. How are you? Welcome, Welcome back, back, Jack. We yes, love you, sir. Jack. We love you back. I mean, I do. But yeah. the, the divine <laughs> we loves you back. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, Jack Clemens is a former Lockheed Martin engineer, executive, and degreed rocket scientist. He was an engineer uh, for NASA's Apollo space shuttle programs. Uh, he has given talks across the Mid-Atlantic region on the Apollo Moon Program and on the subject of why science matters. He also appeared in the Command Module segment of Moon Machines, the Discovery Science Channel six-part documentary about the Apollo Program. He's also a published science fiction author and a new nine, non-fiction book out. Oh, God, I'm reading this terrible. And I can help you. <laughs> And book has, author. Oh my God! And I'm just has read from this. <laughs> right, a new nonfiction book out. Save the Earth: The Men and Women Who Brought the Astronauts Home. Welcome to the show, Jack. Thank you. There's Mike. Much. Mike's got his copy. All right. Well, Jack is returning, and we're happy to have him back. Um, this is your third, third, fourth, fourth, fourth appearance. Fourth appearance because we did appearance, we did one right. at Balticon. That is mm-hmm. correct. Yes, sir. You guys yep. are getting short of things to talk about, so I'm yeah, glad to fill in. God. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> no, no. First of all, I just want to say, if anyone doesn't understand, Jack is an actual personal friend of Pete and I's. He's invited us to his home. Uh, we've been to the my and my girlfriend, Jenny. Hey, Jen. We've been to the beach, and we, we stopped by on the way home, had a great lunch. And uh, Pete actually was able, fortunate enough, to have some time to go to his book signing or his book, uh, the book uh, party, the book release right. party. Um, I'm sorry I could make it. And um, it's just that we we celebrate this success of yours and uh, are, are in any way proud to be a little part, you know, a little smidge part of it. Uh, <laughs> to be able to say that we knew Jack before, before he wrote this uh, book that, that I mean, I, I was like, I knew that it was going to be a good book. I knew, like, oh, sure, I'm, I'm sure I'll enjoy it. It'll be great. You know, I was blown away after the first two, three chapters. And I, full disclosure, I listened to it on Audible. Um, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, right, Jack? But um, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I don't know why I thought. I didn't think it was going to be this good. Which, <laughs> well, which I, so I, 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 I know. I apologize for the fact yeah, that you're part of this great relationship, <laughs> but you know, I have my reservations. <laughs> Maybe just a good relationship will do. Uh, Pete, help me. I, I think I painted myself into a corner here. <laughs> right here. Let me let me help you get that foot out. No, yeah. well, I think what Mike is saying is is that he was pleasantly surprised and that you know he he hadn't realized just how good of a writer you are. How's that, Mike? Yes. Is that better? Oh, go. yes. Thank you for being my interpreter. <laughs> well, Come for what it's worth, when I submitted this to my publisher, the, the editor that, that I've gotten from the big publisher, the first thing, thing she wrote back and said, do you have a ghostwriter? Oh, really? Like, oh, yeah, nice. I said, no, no. She said, well, I didn't, I, as an engineer, I didn't think you'd write that well. I said, well, well this I... is off to a great start. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I don't exactly uh, – Flaw, um, uh, find her at flaw with that. Engineers, I'm an engineer, and mm-hmm. yeah, they're they're not always great writers. <laughs> it's, it's not you know it's not a thing that goes hand in hand. It should because re- engineers have to write so many papers. I mean that's all they do is write all the time. So you would think that they'd want to concentrate on being better writers. But no, no, Jack, fantastic. It was it was really Thank good. You. I Thank got um like I was telling Jack before the show, 
I got about 90, I want to say not about 90% finished because no, no, I got, got 96, in, 96%. You, you missed I got, like 40 minutes. Yeah, I got into the appendix. I'm, I'm a little deep into the appendix and I was free. I was, you know, I was kind of free basing it because I was trying to catch up, make sure I got it all done before the show. Um, so I, I, I inhaled about three hours of it today and I was like, okay, I'm done. I'm done. Uncle, uncle, so much information. <laughs> well, it just makes me feel so much better about your readership too. So you're, so, so Mike's saying he was surprised that it was well-written and you're saying, oh my God, I got to get through this thing. And I, there's too much information. This is a great sales call so far, guys. I appreciate it. Really. <laughs> Not at no, all. I'm just Not saying, at all. No, there was just so much good. There was so much good information. There's so much I was learning because, you know, I, I wasn't just like passing Passively listening to it. I was actually trying to really absorb it and picture it and picture all this stuff that's going on. But there's so much. I mean, there's so much stuff going on, yeah. um, especially when you get into the appendix and, you know, you're talking about this guy and that guy and, and you know, and, and, and this woman. And uh, and I'm just like, oh, oh, it's too much, too much information. It, you know, well, you're three, listening to it at 1.7 1. 1. 7 times, right? Weren't I you? was. 1.7 yeah, times, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I'm just pulling your leg, guys. I know. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. it. I know. Really. I, know. I, was, I took I took some notes. I mean, and you have to understand, I have a system. Like when I'm driving and I need to take notes, I I have a, a document and I can dictate into it. So I'm like sitting there, like you know, for instance, and we will talk about some of these things. But I'm just like command module twenty percent off center. <laughs> what? I never do that. You know what I mean? Just like so, the the, the book is a cornucopia of factoids, uh, just in, wrapped in such a warm blanket of great stories that that um i think it's well balanced i, I will say that and Thank if you, you haven't read this book i highly recommend reading I, it read it with your eyeballs read it with your earballs either way <laughs> well well let, let's talk about let, let's get into it then so the book the book is is it isn't so much i mean it is about the apollo program and it's about the space shuttle but that's not what it's that's not like the heart of it the heart of the book is about the people who supported that the people behind the scenes who help who help bring our men and women home um and and you know all the work that went into that and and the kind of and jack it's a first person kind of thing like how you were feeling about these things which i think is what made it so awesome because you know it put a personal touch on it it it's not just the facts that you've heard you know, before or facts you've heard before, really getting an inside feel for it. And, and I think from a perspective that most people never get to hear on any of these like Discovery channels or anything like that, because they're always like, you know, Gus Grissom did this and, you know, uh, Neil Armstrong did that. And it was a trying time. And, you know, and, and you're putting your personal feelings. So why don't you tell everybody, like, what was your responsibility and why was it so, uh, you know, why were you so, in, in, you know, involved and integral to these people coming home? Okay, so so my job on Apollo, uh, I was a young engineer that I had that my background in college was high speed aerodynamics, and that has to do with things like guided missiles and asteroids coming through the atmosphere at you know this horrendous speed. Um, but I had gotten that degree because I was interested in the space program. And I was interested in the space program because from a very early age, I wanted to be a writer and I had read a lot of science fiction. So that in this, in my case, the writing got turned around. I wanted to be a writer first and got into the space program because of that speech that you so wonderfully repeated earlier on, Peter. <laughs> so my background, I, because of my background, when I, got, when I got hired by this company, TRW Systems in Houston, Texas, I got hired because of my high-speed aerodynamics background. And in Apollo, that translates into the reentry of the command module when we're coming back from Earth. I mean, from the sun, coming back to Earth from the sun. No, not even from the sun. It's coming back from the moon. They got, this is a very different program that I'm thinking about right now. Right. I must be in my <laughs> right. section. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, the reentry of the Apollo command module to Earth coming back from the moon. Um, and so TRW had this contract with NASA that was basically an extension of their arms and legs for the people that were planning and supporting the NASA people that were planning and supporting these various flights of Apollo. And I was one of those. TRW had the contract for everything from the standpoint of, you know, from launch to reentry to splashdown to recovery, to everything. And so they apportioned that. And so the reason that where I got to play the role was during reentry. And I played it, uh, I started really doing it seriously with Apollo. Uh, nine and then all the way through to the end of 17 because uh, i had gotten down there right around gotten to work down there right around the time apollo 
7, and which is about right now. Apollo 7 was in orbit. So that's what where my background was. And so I, then as now, I was a, I, I kept everything. I was almost a hoarder of stuff. And in particularly on a program like that, we knew what we were doing was really special. So I have all my notes. I have everything. I have my performance evaluation reports from my manager. I have all the things I did. I have copies of the stuff. I had all that from all this time. And so when it came to finally getting around to writing this, I, I started it off as sort of a memoir. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, I started off as a series of blogs for Amazing Stories Magazine online. And just because they had me writing something once a week and I was going to write about something, so it was this. And so I started with that. But as it evolved, it became much more than that. And in fact, memoir, as you notice, is not in the title anywhere. It became about what it was like to work at that level on this program because we knew about the astronauts. And if you watch the movies, you certainly know about mission control and, you know, failure is not an option. But mm -hmm. there, there's, this, there's this layer below this. There were 400,000 people that worked on that program. And we and the public knows maybe you know twenty if they're lucky fifty right. if they're really lucky, and so I, I realized that I, I've had this experience of being there and working on this, and 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 then I in turn was just one of those other four hundred thousand people, right? And we all depended on them to be doing the same thing we did, and we had no idea what it was they were doing. I mean, how well they were doing it. Right. So if somebody was designing the command module or somebody was building the lunar module or somebody was figuring out how to get where to put the ships during reentry. They had to do that independent of us. We didn't have any way to communicate with each other, but we all had to go trust that the other guys were doing their jobs as well as we were. And so by going ahead and looking at what I was doing and how I did it, and then especially the people I got to interact with both at NASA and the people I was working with uh, at TRW and then later shuttle, it became the story about them. And, and that's what I try to turn it back into. And so the story, as much as I can, I do, I have to talk to a certain extent about the, about the work itself, mm -hmm. but I try to do that and I try to make it accessible uh, to the reader because who aren't really interested in, you know, what re-entry uh, aerodynamics is all about. Right. <laughs> but, but it's necessary to set the stage, but then it's really about those folks. And that's where it ended up. And then yeah. it covered my time, and then and and then kind of to jump quickly on the space shuttle. I ended up working for IBM, who was literally down the street from the TRW company, also across the street from the Mission Control Center for NASA, and T and IBM had just won the contract to build all the onboard st software for the space shuttle. So I went now down, down there as a, sort of an engineer, because by that time almost all the programmers that IBM had were women, because engineers weren't taught programming mm -hmm. in college. So I went to this world that was almost all female, but they were programmers and NASA didn't understand programmers or programming. So they hired a bunch of us to come in as engineers and be kind of trans universal translators. Well, let, let me ask you something. What was that like? Was, was there a certain amount of uh, like people looking down at you or at any man who would do this at that point? Was there any kind of stigma to being a computer programmer back then? No, it just wasn't. Okay. It, it just wasn't taught. If you, I don't know if you saw Hidden, Hidden Figures, right? The movie. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, it it just wasn't one of the <laughs> things we were taught. We were. I, I learned all the, you know, how to do a lot of stuff, but programming wasn't one of them. We were using mainframe computers in college, and we only had limited access to them. Mm -hmm. We were doing a lot of stuff by slide rule. There wasn't a real big reason in the '60s for me now to have a class in. Pro in computer programming because it was kind of a technical skill and there were four or five people in the universe or let's say at the university at least that knew how to do it so we just give them our give them our decks so it's just not a skill that was in demand mm -hmm. but and and still for apollo it wasn't much uh, but but immediately upon the transaction to space shuttle that technology changed because of all the onboard software and so we needed people that could write that pro those programs so yeah, it's like it's like boy did that change you know it's yeah. like eh, there's only a few people that's programmers whatever and then yep. next thing you know it's just like oh my god we need programmers fast more of them better ones yep. Yep. and you, if you saw the movie hidden figures that's what that's about except it's right. an earlier generation it's late early to late 50s but these are the women with math backgrounds uh, who now had to come in and do the math to figure out how you, and originally those programmers were literally computer pro, those computer 
what are they called? Com com the computer programmers, I guess, were literally, <laughs> literally computers. I mean, they were just doing yeah. stuff by, by hand. Right. And do and if you saw the movie, they were doing all those calculations to try to figure out stuff about the launch and reentry. And the mainframes were just coming in, and nobody knew how to program them. I mean, right. except the IBM techs who really didn't know how to do anything practical with them. So, yeah, that's really what happened. And so by the time I got to shuttles, so now we're 10 or 15 years down the road, that whole wave, those weren't just a few people now. These were now hundreds of people, hundreds of women who had graduated from college with, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, math backgrounds and got I, hired in to do programming. I, I don't know whether it's just me knowing you and having spent you know, a, a fair uh, amount of time with you socially and everything that – my, I appreciate it, I think, more, and I don't know if anyone else will appreciate this as much, but I think you buried the lead on some of your personal things, especially in the beginning. Like, folks, this man, his father was a private investigator. <laughs> he was a PI. I just, I, to me, that's like, wow, tell, talk about like the most awesome take your son, you know, take your father to work day or we're, take, your, <laughs> take your son yeah, to work like, day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One or the other. Yeah. And, 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 and the other thing is I think that is amazing, and I think it, it bears more importance than uh, you even. Well, I think you did give it some credence uh, even in the book that to say that in, you know, probably because of some of your earlier issues in your <clears> – <throat> I'm going to use this, and, and there are some definite air quotes here – your illustrious military career, yes. uh, <laughs> that I think without that, you would not have had any opportunities to have – the experiences of working on the Apollo missions. You know what I mean? It was like so. sort of a uh, unfortunate and fortuitous uh, situation. And yet you still got your classified, you know, clearance and everything else that you needed. So okay. I, I just say, bro. Oh, oh, Hey, uh, cheers to you, my friend. Cheers to you. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm not drinking alcohol, but I'm. <laughs> <laughs> so I, so, so Jack, um, let, By I, the I, way, everything he's huh? talking about, everything Mike is talking about, is in the book. So, oh, of yeah. course, yes. Oh, yeah, it's, that's the very big. Yep. I, you know, when you were go, when you were going over the first part of this, and you were talking about, um, you know, the, the how they land on the moon and and and, and getting into <clears throat> Apollo thirteen and how it was saved, uh, you know, how how they managed to get home. Um, there was some things that came to my attention, and Mike, I talked to Mike, and. Mm. Mike, Mike didn't have, he didn't miss this in his life. Like I did somehow he, he, I did not pick this up and I don't know why, but the, the, the module that goes to the moon had three parts to it. And what I didn't realize is that, you know, one guy stays in space while the other two go down and I'm listening to I'm like, Oh, I totally learned something. And I should have, I should have known. I feel like I should have known this, but anyway, but it was something I learned. Um, and, it, and it totally, as soon as I, as soon as I was, I'm listening to this and I'm just like, yep, that makes sense. Um, so what I, what I'd like to do right now is just, I'd like to go over this stuff real quick. I got some images I want to share with the audience and I'm going to share them with you all as well, but let okay. me turn these on. And if you could, uh, just explain this just real quick. Let me, uh, I gotta do share screen here. Give me one second. Let's do application and then. So right now I got Kafis looking to the side. Would you like me to explain that? Oh no. Yes. <laughs> oh, I I, I, listen, I, I, oh. I look at the chat room. There so. you go. Yeah. All right, so there you go, and the audience can see this really well. Right. So mm -hmm. so talk us through this. So this is this is the whole spacecraft. This is the whole right. um, Apollo space. Well, not the launching part, but you know, yep. what goes to the moon. Yes. Well, it's the it's the part that leaves the Earth. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, all right. So what do you want? You want me to explain what that is? Just, just real quick, because I've got I've got four images here, and I've got right, each well, one that, of the very quickly. Yeah. That's that's the uh, upper stage of the Saturn V rocket, and it's kind of a, showing a cutaway view. When it's launched, all of that is solid, and it just looks like a big tube of toothpaste. Mm -hmm. And then that little red thing at the end is a um, is a launch escape um, uh, rocket. So worst case, th theoretically, could, could you put that back up for me so I can look at it? Oh, you like, just got to click. Oh, you, you yeah, click on it. it yeah. Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Anyway, that that kind of red thing at the top, that's a launch escape rockets. And, and, it, and if, it, if everything else goes wrong, it could theoretically pull the command module free and the astronauts could go back and land in the ocean. Uh, this okay. is, so this is an early stage of the, of the uh, yeah, I can't get this to come up on my side. 
Just click on Pete's. Uh, okay, click on right. Pete's. Yeah, I got it. Yep. There you go. Um, now, inside of that tube of toothpaste, there is the rest of the uh, is all the stuff that goes to the moon. So the very top that with those three little squinched in people in it, that's called the command module, mm -hmm. and that's the part that that when it is, that's one section by itself that can be separated from the other two, and then the thing behind that with the two uh, big orange balls and the, the kind of a rocket thrust, uh, the rocket engine toward the back of it. That's called the service module. Um, and that does not get populated at all. All that is, is, is a big, uh, it's a place for uh, engine, for engine firing fuels, for uh, power, for water. Uh, it's kind of big storage closet. And then at the very bottom of that is the lunar module all kind of folded up, sort of like a spider going to sleep or something, all kind of folded up in there. Mm -hmm. So those are the three parts of the spacecraft that ultimately go to the moon. That that red rocket at the top, as soon as the uh, astronauts are clear of, um, and, and, and sure they're getting into orbit, they get rid of that. So what mm -hmm. you're left is that the rest of that. And I don't know what you're going to show me next, but oh. okay. So then, so that, that has to be then disassembled. Does does it pop off automatically, or does it, or do it, they? No, it gets fired. They they, they, they uh, eject it from inside. Okay. All right. So then this next image. Okay, uh, so here's your command module. All right, so now back up one for me. Uh, back up, okay. So, what happens once they get into space? That big outer shell is is uh, that's the toothpaste tube is is basically bro broken away. That command module itself now fires. The command module and the service module are attached to each other. The service module is the thing that has like the rocket booster, what says the engine at the back. All that comes away, and the lunar module is still inside the rocket inside that shell. Okay. It, they turn it around and now the, the tip of the command module, that pointy point, is has a docking ring on it. It goes down, it docks with the top of the lunar module and it pulls it out of there. What? Okay. Okay, so now what you've got, in, instead of the three th is things stacked this way, you've got the co a command and service module are together as one thing and that rocket engine at the back is now exposed to space. And it's flipped 180 degrees, and the command module where the, the humans are is now goes down and docks with the top of the lunar module, which is the thing that takes them to the moon, and pulls it out of there. And that's mm -hmm. the way they go to the moon. So that they've got the, the command module and the lunar module are nose to nose. The right. astronauts are pointing or are, are facing toward it. There's a um, there is a a docking mechanism that allows them to open a a tunnel between the two so they can actually then crawl through the nose of the command module mm -hmm. inside of the lunar module and that service module engine is exposed that's that's outside that's oh, the main wow. engine okay so what uh what is that called when they flip it and then they it's called something docking what is that just CMLM docking? Uh, yeah. Or? yeah, yeah, it's the CSM, CSM LM docking, they call it. Yeah, CM, okay. yep. So that, that's all their tech talk, but CM is command module. Yep. SM is service module. And when they're, when they're joined, those two are joined together, they call it the CSM very cleverly. <laughs> and, and then the lunar module is called the LM, right? So, okay. And so that's it's, where it's, it's the... CSM LM docking, yeah. So and that's where in, in Apollo 13, where the the service module is where they were stirring the tanks, and yep. the, the famous incident happened, and so that's what blew away, and then ended up blowing half the uh, stuff off the. Yeah, and and in fact, look at saying in that same picture, and and forgetting about the lunar module for a minute, let's say mm -hmm. that that's now separated and out on its own, you can see the Apollo command module up there, and you can see where the astronauts' backs are leaning against the the, the flat end of that command mm -hmm. module, right? That's where the um, heat shield is also for reentry. Mm -hmm. And right below it are all those tanks. And so when the oh. when an, when something blew up in the lunar module, part of the concern they had was did they damage the heat shield too? Mm -hmm. right. And if they yeah. had, then they were then it didn't matter what they do to get them back because right. they wouldn't survive right. reentry. Okay. Okay. Does that help? Yes, yes it does. And then so <clears throat> so let's let's go to all right, so we know what the command module is. And let and we know what the the service module is now. How long does the service module stick with them? How long does that um... the whole the whole flight? Okay, so the whole flight and back, right? And back, yes. Okay. The service module the, the, the service module is the is the um, it's it's the it's 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 got everything in it that the people in the command module need. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, if the command module is just look at it as an automobile with no engine, 
Okay. The service module has the rockets, it has the oxygen, it has the uh, 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 water. Um, oh. Oh, so you'd be in pretty short store safe if you didn't have that. Yeah, so it's and it's, it's it stays with the command module on normal missions. It stays with the command module, well, actually on every mission, all the way to the moon and all the way back, and you get rid of it just before you re-enter uh, because it's it's too bulky to take into into re-enter re the atmosphere with. You, you can then jettison it, and then you've got a battery back up inside the command module that will last long enough for you to now land. It's like 50 okay. hours or something. Okay, now, Jack, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Okay. And I do remember in the book, and I took a note of this, that you said that the command module on return, its weight is 12,000 pounds. Correct. Now, do you remember what the weight is of everything that, like, from the original picture that Pete showed with the command, the lunar and the service modules? What, what uh, that, the, not, that entire Not is? without going back into the book. But I, okay, okay. But the, let's put it this way. The Saturn V, I think the Saturn, I think I say in there, a Saturn V engine – could generate six, something like seven and a half million pounds of thrust. Something like I that. think it was like six. Well, I my okay. note my note was six million pounds of thrust. Okay, that's good. Well, I mean, it, it, right, so, one of the nice things about having the book is I don't have to memorize these things anymore. Um, <laughs> so, right. so, Mike, yes, real, real quick, yes. I just want I just want to touch on this because this was kind of important. So when they come back on on Apollo thirteen, right? Yep. They have to come back. They come back in the lunar module, right? Yep. They mm -hmm. actually it's, so instead of having the service module, which they would normally have, that has all their, you know, like you said, like their water and their extra oxygen right. and all that good, that all that good stuff that you say you'd be in trouble with if you didn't have, right? Yep. They didn't have it, so right. they had. <laughs> They had to come back with the lunar module, but still attached to the command module mm -hmm. and the service module. Yeah. So now it's dead weight. The command module has basically no power at all. It has power, but you can't use it that far out because it's only it, – you'd be using the batteries. They only last 50 hours. You need those for the last part of reentry and landing. And so if you use the batteries in the command module while you're out there for another two days, you have no way to reenter. So, but they also couldn't get rid of the service module because they didn't know what external damage it had done. And so they, they wanted to keep keep it with them all the way down for fear that if they separated somehow, they would then not be able to return uh, uh, return it all. They didn't want to get rid of it until they got close to Earth. So everything now – now the lunar module becomes their bread and butter, and it has only – it has, it has limited amount of power also and mm -hmm. oxygen and all the rest. It was designed for two people for about two and a half days. It was used for three people – I mean for – yeah, at most about two, two and a half days. It, it was used for three people for about three days, uh, and it had to push something it had never had to push before, which is the combined command and service module. It had to push it in front of it all the way back to the to Earth using its engines, not the ones on the command module. And, so it's, not, and it's not structurally made to do that. Like, oh, no, I'm sure they were worried this thing might crumble under the, the pressure of it. I mean, it, was, it had to be lightweight. When, uh, going back to the six million pound uh, – uh, uh, thrust of the uh, Saturn V, that was necessary because that's what it took. I mean, because that's how much weight that whole mm -hmm. system had, and you can't. You have to have more thrust. You have to have enough thrust to lift all that weight out mm -hmm. of out of the Earth's gravity and up into orbit. In fact, that's why those stages happen, because if you had one big big uh, spacecraft with all those that with it had all that power in it, all that fuel, it wouldn't be able to lift itself all the way into the into um, Earth orbit because it's too heavy. So the, the rocket was built with stages. And when they burned the engine in the first stage, get all that as much as they could, they get rid of that. So now we got rid of the dead weight. Then the second stage would fire. I got less weight now, put it up, and then they get rid of that. And then the third. So all the way up into space, you're dumping useless weight because everything, every pound goes into orbit requires a pound of thrust. Mm, right, right. And then, Great. so we were we were talking we were talking yesterday on our, on our pre-flight just to make sure everything worked, um, and and so you've got the the one person uh, in the case of uh, uh, of Apollo Eleven, you, it's Michael Collins, right? Right. Is mm -hmm. is orbiting the moon while the other two were down on the on the planet or right. planet on the moon, um, mm -hmm. on the floating body. Uh, so you, you have the, you have Michael Collins circling around, and you said that he's basically. All by himself, especially when he gets around to the dark side, right? Right. 
Yeah, Michael, uh, so that actually started with Apollo 8, of course. I mean, Apollo 8 was our first mission to send human beings and all white men astronauts. Uh, yeah. Our first mission to fly uh, humans to the moon. And we did it, and then we put them in orbit around the moon. We just didn't let them just circle. They went up there for, you know, several uh, – for a day or so, they orbited – the moon quite a bit. Every time they're behind the moon, they're alone, right? They're separated from Earth. So, so those three astronauts had no contact, whatever. And no radio contact. That's no important radio contact. Yeah. They couldn't even, there was no way to communicate. They were utterly alone. When we get to, uh, I think it was Apollo 10, uh, they went up and did a full dress rehearsal of the lunar landing. That was a 10, real, just precedes 11. So Apollo 10 was a complete dress rehearsal all the way down to the two astronauts get into the lunar module. They separate from the command module. They descend. They don't actually land. Um, they fire their asset engine. They come back. Meanwhile, the, the command module pilot is by himself orbiting the moon. So now he becomes the first solo human to ever be w totally without contact of anybody on Earth. The loneliest man alive. That's right. And yeah. then that and then that happened again for 11 and 12, 13. It didn't because, mm -hmm. you know, because of what happened. 14, 15, 16, and 17. There were people out there. They were by themselves. They're in the real, real dark. If you can imagine being out there wow. in a spacecraft that has only flown a few times and mm. your colleagues are down on the planet, you know, on the moon wandering around and you're up there in this machine <laughs> And it's creaking and it's rumbling and it's making all kinds of noise, and uh, it's not the it's it's and better technology already exists is being developed for space shuttle by that time, right? And you're all by yourself. Yeah, yeah. That that's got to be a little unnerving to know that. Yeah, uh, it would be uh, for me. You're you're <laughs> in you're in a piece of equipment that is already outdated, and right. they're working on something better, and yet you're in this old, outdated piece of equipment circling the moon. <laughs> right. Right. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I get questions all the time about, well, you know, how did you guys do that with slide rules? And, oh, my God, you know, that technology is so old, and look what we have now. It's like that, that technology changed almost overnight. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I left uh, TRW in 1974 and went to work for uh, uh, IBM. 74, we were still using slide rules to do uh, Apollo. I move over to IBM. They've got – we're building the uh, software for the onboard computers that will completely run a space shuttle mission, and it has to. That's the space shuttle yeah. can't be flown by humans in many stages of it. Oh, we're, don't that, worry. We're going to, we're going to, I have a bone to pick with the, the computer on okay. board the shuttle. Yeah. But, okay. uh, we'll so, get to so that I, in just a second. I just want to touch on, <laughs> I want to touch on one more thing when it comes to Apollo. Whatever. Because, um, I, I don't so, mind talking about any of this. Yeah. Right. So, well, actually, I kind of two things, but we'll see. Uh, All right. So, so one of them was I didn't realize how tight that re entry angle is and like, yes. you know, and how worried you must have been that, you know, uh, I mean, Apollo 13, of course, and I don't want to talk too much about Apollo 13. Everybody talks about that. But, like, just the fact that it kept changing, it, it kept changing its angle of approach. Right. And, right. Um, and, it, and it's a very narrow band to hit the Earth just right. And right. It, too high, you kill them. Too low, you kill them. Correct. So, like, what is that angle? What, what is it? It's, it's five it's, degrees? It, yeah, it's, I think it was, like, seven degrees. But, it, yeah, it was yeah, the okay. – uh, uh, the uh, entry quarter, they called it, the re-entry quarter. Mm -hmm. And it was and it was the way I've tried to explain it to people is it, the Earth obviously is round, so the atmosphere around it is round. So I'm coming back from the moon, you know, on a beeline. And if I come in and, and the command module, once you get rid of all this other stuff, get rid of the lunar module, you get rid of the service module, you got this thing that looks like a Hershey's kiss. Mm -hmm. and it has no capability of propelling itself forward or backward. It's just dead weight. It can rotate with some engines, but that's it. So this thing comes roaring through the atmosphere. If you're up too high, it, it's going to go right through. It's just – there's just not enough drag to slow it down, and that, that it requires that drag or it's just going to keep on going. And, and we have limited battery power, so you don't want to skip that and go all the way – try to come all the way back around and then try again because mm -hmm. you, you may not have enough battery, battery power to do it. Come in too deep, it's a – it's a jump off the high board. It's a belly flop <laughs> off of the Olympic high board. Mm -hmm. And now you come down, and you're going to slow down all right, but you could actually destroy the, the command module. You, yeah. and long before that, I think the command module could take like 20 Gs. Long before that, though, the crew could black out. And, mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah, it was fairly narrow, and you had to hit this window. Uh, so it was called the reentry corridor, fairly close. Not too high, not too low, just right.
Yeah. And then and then give that command module a chance to fly the reentry. And then well, and then like and during that entire time of reentry, this is the second thing that during that time of reentry, uh, you've got the you've, you've got those uh, the the heat shield and it's ablative, right. so it's yep. it's burning off to to slough off that that heat that it's picking up. Right. Uh, and it creates it, uh, what is it creates a, a supersonic speed? It creates a plasma cloud, right? Right. And they, you can't you get the they, world's, again. World's worst radio static. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then right? you're but, you're back in radio blackout pretty much, right? Yep. Now, what? Am, and, how long was that? Uh, it's supposed blackout? to be about three minutes. Three minutes, right? Right. Yeah, okay. And I mean, from the time so uh, reentry started about an altitude of about four hundred thousand feet, and that's really beyond the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. But the reentry programs were started there to give get them warmed up, get things started, uh, and so that was for us the beginning of reentry. And then as it started coming in, uh, it, it I think the the first time you you detected anything on the sensors was a, a point called point oh five Gs. So we're just now starting to get some 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 pushback on the command module and then as it starts coming in and 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 although a lot of people imagine this ride on the uh, command module sort of like a big you know like a porpoise diving or something this thing was one hell of a roller coaster ride mm -hmm. because you were commenting earlier about the weight the the weight of the command module wasn't evenly distributed it was distributed with some weight on one side so that when it came into the atmosphere it would tilt a little bit right right and now it's coming in you know it's just pouring in fat in first as fast as it can and the first thing it has to do is make sure it's going deep enough in the uh, atmosphere to slow it down so it can roll so it had a, the ability with these engines to roll to one side and that would kind of drag it down and then it's like oops we don't want to get too far down there roll it back up and, and keep it there uh okay now where was that that uh recovery ship oh it's way over there in the pacific i got to roll left to get over there and then right it was one monstrous um roller coaster ride it was and it it lasted uh, about, I think it was about total of about 12 or 13 minutes, but but the blackout period ran of that ran about uh, three, right. and that was from when the heat the, the heat buildup was so high on the outside of that command module that uh, from this ablation that you couldn't talk to them, mm -hmm. right. and then normally a normal reentry would take about it would take a, a, about like I said about three minutes, and then it would cool off enough, and then we could pick them up. Paul says the no burn return path. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. That's right. But then, you know, when you if you have a problem and you think you might have damaged the heat shield and yep. your your contact doesn't start back up after three and a half minutes, you start yep. to get worried, right? Yes, we did. Very, very, very much. Uh, we were in the, and and this is the thing when I said my wife and I were watching the movie together. So I was in the back room for that flight. The, these the arms and legs that we provided for NASA were were a, were really that. I mean, they they didn't need us over there all the time for all the parts of the mission, but on Apollo 11, uh, which was you know all hands on deck, mm -hmm. and on Apollo 13, which is what the heck, right. we, uh, we were over there, and I was in that one of those back rooms. If you watch those uh, old fo films of the mission control room, or actually the new ones, and you see all these you know lighted displays all out in front of you, behind that are a set of offices and rooms that support people work and they were connected by headset mm -hmm. to the people in command. And so I was back there. Yeah. And we, we didn't know. I mean, I was supporting that reentry and we were like, what the hell happened here? It was right. on, it was another minute and a half of dark, of black, of blackout. And we genuinely thought we lost them because they should have been out of that blackout period. So the only thing we could conclude was they weren't talking to us because they burned up during reentry and they were dead, just like the Columbia accident. Mm -hmm, that right. They were, that, that they were gone after all that. Uh, and so when they came on and said, you know, Paul 13 here, it's like, what the heck, you know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> holy smoke. It was a tremendous emotional swing. Mm -hmm. I'll uh, bet. I'll bet. So just in case anyone wasn't clear, Jack was on the team that was all focused on how they were going to get Apollo to reenter the right. atmosphere. So he, yeah. and I think it was really cool point in the book that <laughs> when you got to, uh, when you got to NASA and TRW, they, they, they said, all right, well, we need you to take this thing here and we need you to get this to land, you know, on the earth. And they're like, you're like, well, no, see, I, 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 I learned how to do missiles in, in school. <laughs> the pointy end goes down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Things I, things I sent through the earth don't come in that way. They go the right. other way. Right. See, yeah, see, so. you all, you all, he takes his picture. You see, you all have it backwards. Like, yeah. It goes, it goes this way. <laughs> You're not going to need to move the earth over here if that's what you want to do. <laughs> we, are you sure you want me on this? <laughs> 
but it, but as it happened, uh, they didn't have any engineers at TRW that had high speed aerodynamic in, uh, background, and so they hired me because I did, mm -hmm. and that worked out to my benefit. Although I had to go figure out what the heck what the heck this was all about, where they were starting from at that point, what TRW was starting with at that point was we were we were building these procedures for them, and the procedures had for re-entry they had two components one was how could they watch the the actual onboard computer and make sure it was okay it was pretty primitive it could fly a re-entry uh, but it was very very primitive and and so there was a lot of backup things to look at a lot of controls you could watch and a lot of times if the crew didn't trust it they could just take over and fly it themselves and there was some crude crude but but effective ways to fly it manually so that was one thing, which was when do you leave? When do you tell the computer it's okay, and when do you take over? And keep in mind, every one of those roller coaster rides is different, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they're coming Depends on in the temperature, the and the how atmosphere. far downrange you're going, and mm -hmm. oh, a storm came up, they had to move the aircraft carrier, or you know all this stuff. So mm -hmm. all those were different. And then, then the second part was okay. You've told me that I need to take over. What now? So then we had to give them the backup procedure. What do you do? What what do you monitor? What do you do? How do you control it? And we had the opportunity to fly the simulators that NASA had over there. Mm -hmm. uh, they were like, uh, you know, they weren't. We didn't get to get go in the ones that spun around like Disney World, and thank God. Right. But we had we had the ones that were you know more like the ones you'd see at an arcade, where we'd sit there. But it was fully equipped, and I could sit in a, and it had the actual com, uh, com, command modules, displays, and controls in it, and a contr computer. I could sit in there, and my colleagues could send me a real you know, a, a correct re-entry or they could make something happen. And I'm supposed to figure it out just watching it. We'd all take turns. Well, and we, from that, we would figure out how it was, what these astronauts had to do if they took over. What do they watch? Sure. If they took over, what I mean, they Jack, it was it was so simple. All they had to do at, at yeah. seven Gs was uh, <laughs> just reach up and, and – Just reach up and just start yeah, hitting just, buttons. Yeah. But if you press right, so, just type so in – <laughs> Maybe I'll find something to read about that in a little bit. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Hey, I, I mean, I'm just supposing. <laughs> hey, wrong. So, so we got we do have a question from the chat room. We have two actually. Uh, one, a a uh, Jack, you have a fan, uh, a, a Paul Clemens. I, I I've heard that name before. Uh, actually, Wait a minute. It, it, he's one of my the... he's one of my favorite fans. Yeah, yeah. Paul is Paul is the uh, he he's the Apollo or is he the STS? He's the Apollo, and uh, yeah. that's right, and Peter met him. Yes, I he did. Yes, wife, I did. He and his wife were okay. at the. Uh, cool, cool. Yeah. Good guy. Uh, he was really, actually, he was a really nice dude. Um, it says, uh, he says, did NASA. Yeah, consider... By the way, it, it, that's not a secret. Yes, he's my oldest son, and he yep. was the god of Apollo. The, okay. Right. <laughs> right. Did, he says, uh, did NASA consider ice as an ablative material? I, is that an inside? That's a good joke? question. Yeah, I mean, it is. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I obviously ice is an ablative material, but it didn't really come up on Apollo because we were never cold. When we, right. these things were coming back, it was even in the middle of, of winter, it was red hot coming through that atmosphere. It did come up on, uh, on an incident on uh, space shuttle later on okay. that maybe we could talk about. Okay. All right. Ooh. And then. And Paul, uh, Paul Nunes has a question, but I'm going to save that. Paul, I'm going to save that for a little bit yeah. later in the discussion. And and uh, this is a great point for me to uh, enter one of my questions. And that yeah. is for – actually, this is for Pete because you started, uh, Jack, working on the uh, Apollo. You were basically started your job at TRW about the age of 24, mm -hmm. right? So, Pete, where were, what were you doing at 24? Oh, God. All right, so I – at 24, I was a draftsman at an engineering company. Uh, drafting HVAC layouts and plumbing layouts. That's mm. what I did. HVAC mm. and plumbing design. Um, not as, I would say, probably not nearly as interesting as what Jack yeah, was Because, doing. you know, I'm just saying, because Jack was working on command module reentry, <laughs> and the average age of people working on that was 28. So right. I'm just, you know, well, hey, Mike, what, what were you When what did you, you give doing? up? What I was driving as, at 24, I was driving a Zamboni in an ice rink. <laughs> Okay. So very, totally. very important work. Speaking of uh, ablations. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, actually, going back, I've been thinking about Paul Clemens' question, and and ice is kind of ablative and kind of not. Ice will melt and liquefy and then burn off, depending on what it's exposed to. But the ablative material on this 
command module didn't turn to liquid. It went directly from a solid to a, a gas. That was that's and that was the difference, because it, it it could immediately carry that stuff away. It didn't let any of it hang around. But under certain circumstances, certainly ice is also a can also be an ablative material. Right. Right. Um, yeah, Jenny has us all beat. She was married with a six-year-old. Yeah, there you go. That's a job. That's a job. Yeah. Uh, and then one one last thing, and then I want to move on to space. I want to move on to I want to move on to Skylab real quick, just just for a sure. minute. Whatever and then you want. On the space shuttle. Um, so uh, Paul again. Paul Noon says, uh, so "Did they plan for a rescue module after Apollo 13? So after Apollo 13, did they do anything different? Did they modify anything for, or was there was just too much stuff going on, wasn't there? I mean, right. they were yeah, like no. launching these things one right after another. Everything was in the pipeline. Yeah. Well, it started slowing down with 13. It was they were one after another through Apollo 12. Okay. Because uh, we, we choose to go to the moon. We're going to return safely to Earth by the end of the decade. So that meant get it done by the end of 69." So they were. They had Apollo 11, which was in July of 69. They had Apollo 12 in, I think it was November 69. In case something happened on 11, 12, right. you know, 12 would still be the one that could do it. And then it slowed down, but it still was like every four or six months. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't exactly. You know, slow. <laughs> That's one right after another, as far as I'm yeah. concerned. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. come on. But I mean, we've been doing them like every three months and uh, planning for each one simultaneously for a stretch there. But okay, yeah. So before so, we move on, Pete, before we move on, wait, you had a question. Yeah, I didn't Mike, Mike, oh, I'm let me answer. Okay. Oh, that, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that was it. That's all I had. What was the question? Oh, no, the question was, did they did they do anything? Did <laughs> oh. they, uh, any kind of escape uh, procedure? Or, like anything to help with that? To, to no, uh, that? no. They, as, it, as it turned out, we were making stuff up as we went along on Apollo 13, as you probably imagine. I mean, Apollo... Uh, one to uh, or Apollo really after Apollo one fire after the Apollo one fire they locked down everything and then they trained for these missions for sequentially for years and they were all very well thought out so all the way through Apollo eleven uh, and twelve were were basically working off of a portfolio of plans um, right and and they were I mean I'm not diminishing them we were going to the moon but but Apollo thirteen was unlike anything it ever experienced before and as the use of the lunar module to bring everything back all that stuff they had to do was completely had to be developed and 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 tried uh in real time on the fly uh so the whole focus there was could we get them back at all right. once we got them back then it turned to uh well what exactly happened here and it turned out it was a generic problem in some of the wiring in the in the service module and so once they fixed that and they t and they changed it and fixed it and determined that wasn't going to happen again then they just you know then from that point on they just went ahead and it turned out to be okay i mean yes another another problem might have popped up but they didn't know what it was they fixed right. the one they had right so they right. didn't they didn't change anything they not even and change the scrubbers uh fitting properly to incompatibility to the uh yeah <laughs> no. Dude, that well, that was, that that was all a magic a magic show yeah. that that whole if you saw the movie apollo 13 mm -hmm. that was that's exactly what happened and it's astonishing to watch people like that and now we're talking about people behind the scenes to watch people like that pull this off it's i mean looking back on it yeah we did it and, but at the time every step could have cost somebody their lives mm -hmm. and we didn't know they were right. trying to figure it out as they went it was astonishing yeah yeah. Uh, and the lunar module has, has always been my hero. I love the Gremlin lunar module. That was a terrific, terrific spacecraft. It never had a problem during any of the lunar flights itself. It landed and successfully. It brought astronauts back and forth. And when called to it, uh, it was able to save the entire crew uh, uh, and the, bring the command module and service module all the way back. It's mm -hmm. an astonishing vehicle. The best spacecraft the humans have ever built. Nice. Far. To this date. To this date. Yeah, yep. yeah. It, it cool. was also the first and still only human-occupied spacecraft built to fly only in space. Oh, okay. You yeah. couldn't fly in the atmosphere anywhere. Yeah. Right. Right. All right. So let, let's 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 move on. Let's talk about yeah, Skylab yeah, yeah. for just a minute. You so you worked mm -hmm. on Skylab, mm -hmm. um, and that was re-entry as well, right? Uh, people yes. going up to Skylab and coming back down again. Yep. Um, and, and it's funny because you, you had mentioned that the person was talking to you, uh, was it your publisher was talking to you about Skylab and you're like, 
I didn't work on that. And then you had to go back and go, oh yeah, yes I did. <laughs> no, yeah, that was my agent. But yeah, when you, I, was okay. putting, I was putting this book together and I had, I have an agent in New York that I've had for 20 or 30 years that we've had a wonderful, if rather antiseptic relationship since we never got anything sold. Uh, but all along he was telling me, do you do this program, do this program, get something about Apollo and shuttle at that time. So when I finally got around to writing it and I sent it to him, oh, I love it. This is really good. It's a little short. Uh, and I said, how short? And he said, you, well, double the length. Uh, this was back in the uh, early 2012. So I was like, well, what are we going to talk about? He said, well, for example, you worked on Skylab. I said, no, I don't think I did. He said, no, I remember you telling me that. I said, I don't think so, Matt. So I went back into all my files and there I had all that data about Skylab. I had reports of what I had done. I had <laughs> managers telling me how great I did this thing or, you know, how well this thing was done. It's like, okay. So I wrote about Skylab. Nice. Uh, yeah. And uh, all right. So uh, Mike, unless you have anything about Skylab, cause that was just I, like a short stint. There wasn't I a whole do. lot. I have, I, have a, uh, uh, I guess a physical question. Uh, since Skylab had no like predestination for when it was going to crash, and I remember in the book you talked about there were more planned missions, but budget cuts and some other issues, right. um, I guess after three or – was it only three or four missions up? I can't remember. Three went up. Something, yeah. So uh, you said that it you know, basically uh, plunged down, you know, burned up on – most of it burned up in the atmosphere and plunged down into the ocean. Right. Um, a question was, did you guys account for – if it was going to um, be on a trajectory to a highly populated area, yep. what was the uh, plan since all the computer systems on board had started failing because right. it had been sitting so long? What right. was the idea? And, for and, that? and it didn't have any engines. It, it, right, only, right. it, it, it was like uh, uh, it, it only had rotational engines. It didn't have any way to propel itself. Yeah, they were nervous about it a lot. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, so it was this. Yeah, it was uh, – I, I, as I recall, they were able to uh, – to fire some of those lateral engines a bit okay. to adjust it. And they, they were running, but they, they were kept trying. It was, it was like the problem we had on Apollo 13 where we didn't know where it was coming in, except we also had little to do with, that we could do about it. Mm. But, but they fired it a little bit, but they finally tried to get it to enter at a point in the, uh, in the Northern Pacific, I think, that would allow it to come all the way you know, across the Pacific, have this wide open area of space, and, um, and hopefully land someplace where it wouldn't, uh, kill anybody. I think a chunk of it finally landed in Australia anyway, though. Some wow. guy dug it up. Oh, nice. Oh, cool. Yeah. Brought it back to so, the United States. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. For I'm those who people name. don't know, Skylab was a version of the uh, International Space Station built in the 70s. Yeah, it was the, uh, it was and a it predecessor. Was it was successful. like Mir, right? Was, yeah. was it similar, to, very similar to Mir? Yeah, it was actually much more similar to the International Space Station. Uh, they, oh, okay. It, in the way it was structured inside, um, it, there's some videos if you go look at them on YouTube of mm -hmm. the astronauts inside of uh, uh, you know, operating inside and playing around inside of Skylab, and it it looks like station. Oh, cool. yeah. I hear I hear Skylab had an amazing uh, food system built into it. Uh, an amazing what? Food system, like a system for eating food. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Be, a, well, be amazing to. Um, you know, find some more information about that. Well, you could probably find it somewhere. I, I have a book or two I would recommend. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh, do you? <laughs> do you? Yeah, so, but but yeah, but yeah. So I mean, think about the command module right now. You've got three people squeezed into a little thing that's smaller than a little VW bus. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, bu bug. And you, you basically, if you're going to have to use any of the facilities, you got to do them in place. Then you got you know food that you suck through a tube. Um, but um, but on Skylab, you had this big, wide open thing. They had their private quarters. They had a little mess hall they could sit in. They could take showers. And yeah, the food there is uh, quite different from Apollo. And it's really it's unfortunate somebody doesn't sometime write a book about the foods because that would be, I think that'd be pretty interesting, don't you? Hmm, that would be interesting. I, I yeah. wish, foods about space? Yeah. I wish. I wish someone would. Hmm. Me, yeah. too. Me too. So, so, so real quick, we have uh, – um, I, uh, and I don't want to ruin her name. Uh, it's I think it's Laiwan. Laiwan. La, I'm sorry, I'm ruining your name. Uh, Lazala. And uh, the question is, how does one develop the nerves of steel to do any of these jobs? And and that's a real easy one, right, Jack? It's they're born with it, right? They they can't yeah. do anything else. That's who they are. Yeah, I'm gonna. Uh, in fact, I'll tell you a story that Mike Mullane told me at one point. I I don't remember if he said it when we had him on, but he told me separately about it. 
um, he said if uh, Mike Mullane's an astronaut from that was a friend of mine on the space shuttle. Yeah. Uh, and he said that if a, and an astronaut ever tells you that they're not afraid when they to get in there, he said they're lying to you. He said it's just bullshit. He said you get in there and you close that hatch and you're looking up and you're shaking. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you your whole life depends on this thing going off and you all, all you can think of is you're going to die. He said, but if at that time somebody came along and knocked on the patch and opened it up and said, by the way, I just want to let you know we got word from God himself that you got no more than a one in three chance of surviving this mission to a person. We'd say, slam that thing. We're going. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Right. And I said, that's the difference between people like him and yes. people like me. Right? <laughs> one in three, huh? <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't be up there in the first place. And uh, but, if, but if it were people like me, then, you know, we'd still be around the campfire trying to figure out what's on the right. other side of the next forest. The, mm. uh, Right. They're, they're just they're just made out of that stuff. It's just it's just who they are. It's just yeah, they're yeah. born with it. Yep, and I don't I don't understand it. But and Mike Mullane flew missions in Vietnam, targeting mm -hmm. missions in Vietnam in jets, and he was and when I knew him was saying that back in the day would say you know I'd never do that again. He said that really scares <laughs> me. I, I can't figure out how I was doing that when I was twenty. I'm going you're you're about to go into space <laughs> really, and the whole thing could blow up under you. But they're. It's like, yeah, the, dude, you're about people. to ride. You're about to ride a controlled bomb going off. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, seriously, right. into space. Right, so, into space. Yeah. All right. God so we're, forbid we're, your jet might get shot down. I don't want to. I don't want to go too far over time. So let let's talk about let's talk about your work on the space shuttle because okay. that's really interesting. There's a lot of really interesting stuff about what you did on the space shuttle. Okay. Um, you you switch careers, yeah. right? You weren't. I did. Um, you weren't doing reentry anymore. Right. You, you switched over to a software career. Like, so how does how does that transition work? How did you how do you go from uh, calculating reentry to, to doing software? Uh, well, if you get paid the right amount of money, you do anything you have to. <laughs> no, it was so. By by the time I made that transition, I, I was pretty familiar with the space program itself and how, how things worked and with NASA how they did things, and I also knew a lot of the contacts of the people at the uh, Man Spacecraft Center from my days on from PRW. So, but IBM who hired me and actually 50 of us from TRW, TRW lost a contract they should have won and they closed mm -hmm. the door and we got a job literally down the street, could walk down the street to IBM. They hired about 50 of us engineers to come in and play that role of how do you, how do you translate what the astronauts need and what the hardware needs? How do you translate to, that to computer ease so we can program for it. And so the first few jobs I had were just going by over to my contract, the now new contacts at NASA and saying, what do you guys need? And my contacts as that happened were, were uh, shuttle astronauts to be because the area that I got assigned was the displays and controls, which at the time I thought was going to be kind of dull. It wasn't the sexy, you know, guidance and navigation and flight mm -hmm. control. Area. It was displays and controls, which were like, oh, well, but it turned out the crew, the astronauts themselves were responsible for developing all the requirements on those because NASA wanted them to understand what every one of those controls did. And they wanted to make sure that the displays, the controls, the switches and everything met their needs. So I go over across the street to meet my NASA contact and it's two astronauts, both of which later flew on space shuttle uh, that hadn't flown anything up to that point. And that's who my interactions were. And then because it was displays and controls, it interacted with almost everything inside the space shuttle and everywhere, all the hardware. So that was kind of how I started getting my education on that. And then coming back and I'm learning programming from senior programmers and these women, mostly women, were just incredibly, incredibly, incredibly talented. Mm -hmm. So they were the way they were the ones that helped me, you know, work bridge it back. And then ultimately I ended up managing that whole organization. So by that time I didn't have to do any real work. I was just managing people who did. Right. <laughs> right. So, um, and, and there was, so, so NASA comes to you and, and this, and you're, 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 um, you're not idle, but, but one of the people you admire very much, um, uh, was it Paul Allen? Is that, that's his name, right? No, John Aaron. John Aaron. God, you're right. John Aaron. Sorry. Aaron. Uh, he winds up being your, your client, right? And, right. and he tell them what kind of, um, uh, what kind of error bar you're given for okay. your software? <laughs> so, so just briefly, John Aaron, if anybody has watched the video SCE to Ox, he was the one that saved the Apollo 12 mission. And if you haven't seen it, uh, YouTube it, SCE, the word T-O, Ox, A-U-X. Anyway, for shuttle, he had now moved over and he was, yeah, he was the contact I had to go to to talk about how, 
about about he was my man, the the customer contact for the development of the code. So we had a requirement in our in our soft in, on our software a, cu a customer requirement that said we had to deliver our code with no errors in it, error free. And so when I got that job, I thought I probably ought to go over and talk to him because that wasn't going to happen, right? And and it was it was more than just a contract term. It was they literally were going to deduct. Uh, bonuses, funding from us for each major error they found. So I go over to see him, and I hadn't met him before. And it's like, so he's, I said, so John, I'm. You know, he said, you're here to talk about error-free code. And I said, yeah. He said, uh, you don't think you could do it? And I said, well, no, it's it's not possible. He said, <laughs> he said, okay, I get it. So IBM doesn't think you can give me code with no errors in it. So how many errors does IBM willing to sign up for? And it's like, I mean, what? 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 You know, well, I mean, is it three? Is it five? I said, you know, he, you know, it's not zero, right? So give me the number you're willing to sign up for, because any big error in there, of course, I mean, there are people's lives at stake, right? And so I just want to know what IBM is willing to sign up for. And it's like I have nothing to say. You know? It's like, it's like, what? And he's, it, it was a great story. It was it a great was, part of the book. He basically says, okay, look, look, I understand that. But I do know that if I leave I, error-free code in your contract, IBM will give me the highest possible quality code that you, you can you can come up with. I believe that. And so it's staying in there, and you guys are going to get measured on that. And by the way, we never give them error-free code, but we gave them really, really high – actually, yeah. highest quality code built for a government contract to date. So even, yeah. even better – because Pete and I were debating – not debating, but we had discussed this pre-show – uh, even better than because you also uh, small disclosure you worked on the federal um, avion or what do you call it? FAA, yeah, they are they are traffic control system. Yeah. yeah, so you you would say that that code was even better than the FAA oh, um, air my traffic God. control code. That was the difference between those was between the command module and the and the uh, International Space Station. Well, alrighty then. <laughs> See, Mike? See? I was paying attention. Go. All right. <laughs> I so I, I have a few, and I know we're running, we're kind of running out of time. So right. I have a few questions I wanted to ask. Um, oh, and, and anybody in the chat room, I, I'm going to wrap this up with some of your questions. So we're going to get yes. to them. Okay. So uh, one of the things that really shocked me, and I literally am like, at this point in my notes that I, I'm talking to you as I'm reading this book. I'm like, really, Jack? You mean to tell me four computers, you had four computers on the shuttle, and each of them were playing You're the Weakest Link to decide who wins? Yep. I mean, <laughs> like, a uh, guy, you know, like, you, you could picture four computers talking. I think there's an error here, and the other three are going, nah, there's no error. You're the weakest link. Goodbye. Yep, that's how it <laughs> yeah. worked. So that's how it worked. Okay, and... All these computer, the I, I'm blown away by this. The, the entire computer system on the space shuttle weighed 17,000 pounds. That's correct. More than the command module itself, than the That's, Apollo command module. That is mind blasting. And think about that. This is 1983 or four when we launched yeah. the first, right? And the last, and the last Apollo mission was like 74 or something like that. I mean, we went from you know sticks and drawing on cave walls to that in the period of 10 years to be able to fly with that in a period of 10 years well, to be yeah. fair the 70s and yeah, early, I mean, early 80s it was like you know everything was getting bigger all the radios got bigger the boom boxes everything like I, I was using when i started my engineering career in 1989 uh I, the first computer i worked on was the only ones that they had they didn't even have the 386 they had an ibm 286 and that yeah. was the computer that everyone was using in right. 89. And that thing was like a powerful calculator. I mean, it was, <laughs> you know, so, uh, so you imagine, and, and you gotta remember the space shuttle doesn't have the latest and greatest technology on it at that moment. It's already right. running out of date, right? Cause they started right. that five yep. years beforehand. Right. And so in fact, when station went up, it had a, even more advanced technology. And then on space station, they did a, 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 continue and improve it over that whole period of time that revolution in technology didn't start with us you know with slide rules and then suddenly you know here we are many years later with uh with, uh, with uh, laptops saying oh how did they ever do that that technology evolved during that whole period okay was, you know and one one other question uh, because there are there is so much information i mean we're not even we're scratching the surface of the amount of amazing facts 
and interesting stories from the book. First, I hope you that, that that your readership solves that by buying these books and reading them. I I, yeah. I, I, should, I cannot stress enough. If I mean, don't think. Nah, I'm good. I saw uh, Apollo 13. I'm good. No, no, you're not. You're not good. You 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 only know a little bit. You want to know the full story of, of this <laughs> of this of the entire space race and and beyond. Then oh my god, it's so amazing. Yeah, because you're seeing said, the front end. This right. is the back end. Right. Yep. Yep. That said, uh, you had said this, and I, I it made sense to me. And after the fact, like, why wouldn't um, NASA be part of, and the shuttle missions be a part of putting top secret, uh, you know, satellites and some other top secret uh, missions in right. space? Uh, were there, ha as as of today, are there any of the uh, United States Air Force? Uh, kind of shuttle missions that were declassified? Is there anything that we could, uh, any, that's we could go? Um, so Mike Mullane, who was mm -hmm. an Air Force officer also, Mike Mullane flew in two or three of those. And he still doesn't talk too much about what okay. the details were. So they were doing, you know, they were doing classified missions on, on station. Um, but at least the last time I talked to him about it, they still weren't talking about the ones he was on. And, and that was quite some time ago when he retired. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. But right. you can kind of imagine what they're all about, right? It says uh, a rocket yeah. scientist. Yeah. Right? You're up in space right. and you're looking at stuff from there. Right. <laughs> Gee, it's I not rocket what... surgery. Yeah, right. right, right. All right. So, so, um, so, Mike, did you have anything else? I got. I want to hit some of this stuff in the chat room because I got some really good questions. Yes, I want to do some stuff in the chat room, and I hope we still have time uh, that we can get a little bit of Jack can do some reading. Do oh a, yeah, like yeah. I'll tell you what. So, right. All right, everybody, hang on. Jack, you want to read that part real quick, and then, uh, we'll, and then we'll, we'll handle all the, the chat room yeah. stuff. We'll, we'll burn through that real quick, and then we'll wrap up. So how, how about if I do the Mike Mullane story? You want, you want yeah, me to do that's that? a good one. Sure, sure. That's kind of a funny one. Oh, the reason it's good to read, by the way, uh, as you know, excuse me, <clears throat> is because people can hear me talk about all this, but if you um, hear me read from it, maybe you'll get a sense for what the book really sounds like, okay? So this is a, a, re, a short reading from a section about this astronaut friend of mine, uh, Mike Mullane. Uh, he and I uh, met uh, in, living in the same neighborhood when I worked on the uh, space shuttle program. <clears throat> and this takes place after I had, he flew, went on to fly three space shuttle missions. And this takes place right after he'd flown his first one. And I had, by that time, moved away from Houston. I was working for a part of IBM up in White Plains, New York. Okay. Although I had moved on from Houston before Space Shuttle Discovery touched down, I had one more encounter with my old friend and neighbor, Mike Mullane. In mid-1985, the IBM group I joined in White Plains, New York, hosted a technology conference, and they invited executives from other corporations to attend. Since this wasn't so long after Mike's flight on Discovery, I called him in Houston and persuaded him to be our featured speaker. He hadn't forgotten about my personal memento, when he came to town, he brought along the photo he'd taken of Judy Resnick during their time in orbit and that she had signed for me with her regards. At the conference the next day, we introduced Mike with some NASA footage taken during his flight set to a recording of Elton John's Rocket Man. Mike presented highlights and narrated photographs from his six days aboard Discovery, but then he turned to a story <clears throat> about how very happy he was that the IBM Space Shuttle computer software had worked so well on his flight. A special system of plumbing and valves had been developed for Space Shuttle to use in orbit that was designed to dispose of wastewater into the vacuum of space. PP. No, no uh, spoilers here. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, because of an unexpected blockage in one of the valves on Discovery, the effluent flowed too slowly and accumulated into a massive frozen blob of waste that adhered to the external surface of the orbiter. It was a serious and even life-threatening problem. The icicle was a foot wide and two and a half feet long and weighed somewhere in the vicinity of 30 pounds. It if it wasn't removed, it could snap off during re-entry and collide with the orbiter and damage the heat shield tiles. Mike told our industry executive audience that he had imagined a lot of ways he might die in space, but not one of them was getting killed by a frozen chunk of urine. The block of ice was finally removed by mission commander Hank Hartsfield, who carefully maneuvered the shuttle's remote manipulator arm and bumped it against the icicle until it broke free. The RMS itself was built in Canada, 
but it was controlled by an onboard computer writing, running IBM's uh, flight software. Mike reported that he was living proof that Discovery's subsequent re uh, atmospheric reentry was successful. But he said that large block of frozen waste will likely still be out there somewhere orbiting the Earth. And he cautioned any alien race traveling from some faraway star to visit and explore the Earth to observe the old Boy Scout rule, don't eat yellow snow. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. Very good. Yeah. And that's how the whole book reads, man. Jack's good writer. Good writer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so let's entertain some stuff in the chat because people got some good questions and they're very valid questions. And, so, and as as you're looking for them, I'm just gonna say, good Pete, go and look, look, gather your questions. Um, uh -huh. and and I will just say that uh, we actually, through Jack's graciousness and through Mike Mullane's graciousness, was has come on our show. We actually have, we're lucky enough to do an interview with him and uh, suggest you go back. I think it was either. I got it here. It's, it's season, season four. Three, no, yeah. season three, episode season three. thirty-three, Rocket Man. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And then, so, and then we spoke with Jack before as well, and that was season two, E22, Ground Control. Yeah. So if you want to hear Mike Mullane tell that story himself, because I remember on that episode, he did talk about that. Right. So, yeah, he did. Um, so please uh, go back and look at it. We'd love uh, for people to go back and um, look at Mike, some of our old content. <laughs> Mike is a character. He's one yeah. of the kind. <laughs> And so, he had to go from our interview. I remember he had to go mountain climbing at the end. He's an 80-some-year-old he man. <laughs> yep. We've done here. i got to go mountain climbing. All right, All right, go Mike, ahead, Mike. Mike. So, uh, <laughs> so people were asking about, like, why the space shuttle was discontinued. Uh, is it because it was obsolete? Why haven't we gone back? Will, will the space shuttle be active again? So I guess basically I can wrap all those questions up in the – uh, why no more space shuttle? Will it ever come again? And uh, what what is the deal with that? Uh, okay, I'll try to wrap that up in a short answer. But right. it, it, it was stopped for lack of funding. Um, there was the, the, the Congress and I think a lot of the uh, American citizenry themselves uh, were, were thinking we were spending too much money on it. They, it needed to be upgraded. People didn't want to spend any more on that. And it was stopped. And the idea at that time was, oh, well, we'll build something to replace it within a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Always a bad uh, idea to, you know, take down the, the house before you have a new one planned. Um, and that didn't happen and still is pretty far away. So we have now been without the ability as Americans to launch an astronaut from U.S. soil to get to the space station. We've been relying since then on the uh, good graces of the Russians to uh, get us up and down to space. All, all astronauts that fly to the uh, International Space Station go on Russian Soyuz air, uh, spacecraft, including the Americans, and they come back that way. And then just last week, I guess, there was a explosion or uh, that uh, during launch of one of those, or a, a problem during launch of one of those uh, uh, Apollo Soyuz spacecraft and the astronauts had to come back, come back and land, and now that whole thing is on hold until they figure out what's going on. So right, right. now we have no way, no way, to get astronauts, um, our own astronauts, into space, nor effectively to get the astronauts that are up there back, in right. from the space station. And uh, I don't. One of the astronauts during one of the uh, the problems of. Uh, of of an unmanned spacecraft that blew up. I remember one of the space shuttle astronauts kept saying space is hard. Yeah. Uh, it is very, very, very hard and you can't take shortcuts and you can't make assumptions and you can't assume that, Oh, this will happen well and we'll get it done by such and such a date. It's very hard. Uh, and what's happening is both NASA and the, um, and the private entrepreneurs that are building spacecraft to replace them are finding this out. Yeah. And as and as yeah. I've said in, in, in other formats and forums, um, you know, I love John F. Kennedy being the man that said, let's go to the moon and bring it back safely to Earth. And I think it's wonderful that we have certain uh, uh, private entrepreneurs cheering, cheering us on. Having said all that, I wouldn't want JFK to build a spacecraft. Right. Um, mm -hmm. we, we need people that are more than cheerleaders. We need people who know what they're doing, and this stuff is hard, and little – things can bite you and that's what's happening uh, the other thing I'm concerned about is we've not just lost the ability to launch these things from American soil we've now had a whole generation of folks that knew how to do that retire mm, yeah oh we lost the brain drain yes we did yeah so it's gonna be kind of exciting over the next few years yeah 
And I, I think it's a good. I think the the private sector is picking it up, and I because there is a need, and wherever there's a need, you know, mother, you know, what is it, mother necessity, right? right? And I think I think guys like Elon Musk are doing a fantastic job. Um, I just just the stuff he's like, because they're thinking in new directions that. You know, because the the politics are different there. Because NASA is full of politics. I mean, I love NASA. Don't get me wrong. I wear it a shirt, right? But yeah. <laughs> I love them. But there is there is a level of politics there as well as with any organization. Um, and and you, wouldn't you agree, Jack, that some of the things, some of, like there are some decisions that were made that were just political, just straight up. Yeah, political. absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, every every uh, time the um, presidential election changes things, a new group of people come in that with, from NASA and say, let's do it differently. Uh, uh, Barack Obama canceled a program that was supposed to be the replacement for uh, for our launch capability uh, because it was in it looked it was ineffective and he canceled it. Um, it's it's and then it was changed again when Trump came in, and then back to Elon Musk. As I said, he may be the JFK of this, but he isn't one that's go he's not the one who's personally going to build these spacecraft. And his team has to know how to do that and do it well. And regardless right. of how much cheerleading he does. And I wish he'd do a few of it uh, acting more like an adult. Um, <laughs> right, right. Uh, are, in this are you, area, are at you least. scared? Are you scared for this generation as far as them not taking it as seriously? Or do you think it's going to take a few lives lost like it did in Apollo in the early days of Apollo to for people to sober up? Well, this generation of Americans, yes, I don't think we'll – I think we're not taking it as seriously, and we might find ourselves uh, regretting that at some point. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's true of the gener of all generations of, of this generation and across the mm -hmm. world right now. I think there are nations that are very serious about this, and the people that go back to the moon may not speak English. Um, but yeah, I think we'll get back. I think we as humans will get back. And I think the private enterprise, what it really is best about doing now is taking over that near-Earth orbit stuff. I mean, NASA spent all that energy trying to get people, things into orbit, work the station, all of that. All that technology has been hardened, and now it has to be improved on, and you need to get you know, ast astronauts up and back. I don't think yet private industry is ready to go to back to the moon with humans. They say they are, but that's a much bigger jump, mm -hmm. although I think the, the, the industry partners with NASA right now are working on, uh, are working on some solutions that may work. Right. Right. Near Earth orbit is a definite because we have yep. things in near Earth orbit that we need right. nowadays for, for our, our, the lifestyle we like to live now. Yep. Uh, you, you can't not be able to service satellites or put satellites yep. into space. And so it, it's just and we've that, had 50 years of, of practice at that with the government funding. You know, it's like, um, you know, Christopher Columbus sailed across not knowing what he was doing and found uh, the, the new land, the new world. But you don't have to keep doing it that way. After a while, we get it, right? And now yeah. we can <laughs> right? and it gets humdrum, and it needs to. And so after those adventures and the money that are spent on those adventures and the failures, after that technology is developed and hardened, NASA doesn't have to keep now doing it himself. Now they can turn that over to private industry, which they are. Right. It's just that that industry now is also learning that it's hard. Right. And so the hard in this case so far has meant well behind schedule, although they've had several explosions. And in fact – um, Richard Branson lost a an ast a, a pilot. In one of them. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! But this, it's just but the need the need to go into near space near orbit is is intense. Yep, it should be. there. But going to the moon is that's not as much of a need. There's there's not so much of a need there. That's all about us being humans and doing the thing that we do, right? Yeah, I think so. I think although you know coming from my background, you can imagine that. Uh, I, I think it's something that we do collectively need to do eventually. I mean, yes. if for no other reason, when the big, the next big asteroid that killed the dinosaurs hits here, right. humans are going to be gone, and we'll all, and the octopus will take over or whatever. Um, all right. So uh, we are really running over. Yeah. However, I think Pete, you and I should have one last little say. I have one little last right. thing I wanted to say, uh, and then uh, I don't know if there's anything else in the chat room you wanted to recover. No, I think uh, we've hit just about everything in the chat room. We need. Okay, all right. Well, uh, Pete, I think, because this was right near the end of the book, and I made a note of this because I know how much you appreciate Jack's uh, uh, quotations. Like, you know, you have you have been the recipient yes. of two so far, two gifts that he has given you. I think some that he has even quoted his wife as actually yes. uh, authoring. But uh, I, and I don't know, Jack, who you're going to uh, quote on this. But I, I wrote this down because it is so pithy and so amazing. No dogma is more unyielding 
than that founded on the twin pillars of ignorance and arrogance. Yep. Well, I have to say, I, as far Gospel. as I know, that was mine. Gospel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I apply it specifically to the people who think we didn't land on the moon. And it was yes. all faked. Yeah. Yes. But but right. it but it applies a lot of places. Hey Jack, there are three hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine people who might disagree with that, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe. Just just a couple. Yeah, you know, just a couple people yeah, right. who might have Well, you, you as know, I've said before, I mean if you think if I didn't know about there's five four hundred thousand people. You think if I didn't know that we had faked it, I'd be in here talking to you about this stuff? <laughs> I mean, I can make a million bucks telling the truth about what really happened here. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's goofy. Absolutely. But they aren't persuaded. It doesn't matter. I mean, people who believe that believe it. And the best you can do is say, I beg to differ with you, but you're wrong. Right. Right. Yeah, I'd agree with you, but then we'd both be wrong. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Yes. What yes. It, um, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson has this quote about science that applies here. I'll paraphrase it. The nice thing about the moon landings is that they're true whether or not you believe in them. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Absolutely. I think I did Absolutely. hear him say that once. Yeah. And uh, and 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 because we know that's true, and because they turned around and took pictures of the Earth, we know the damn thing is round. Okay, it's round. It's not flat. It's round. <laughs> <laughs> Period. That, Done. I don't know, saw the cartoon today, but all that proves is that those all those turtles are invisible. Right. Oh, okay. That's <laughs> that was true. a great meme I saw today. Yep. Yep. And then my, the, the other favorite one is, is we know it's not flat because the cats would have pushed everything off the side of it. You know? <laughs> that was yeah. good. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, hey, I, I, we, we need to wrap up. We're on time. We're, we're actually well, well past time, but that's okay, Jack, because you deserve that. You, Thank you. Uh, you, are, you are the man. Uh, let, me give out, let me give out some, some linkage here. Oh, Mike, you want to do the bit.ly? You ready? Uh, yes. Uh, so, the, book, the name of the book is uh, yep, Safely Link. to Earth. The safely, men and women, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, safely go ahead. to Earth. The men and women who brought the astronauts home, and it's available everywhere. Yes. Everywhere, it's audible. Uh, if you want to listen to it, uh, Kindle, right? You can get his yep, ebook. Kindle, you yep, get it. Yes. You get it from the publisher. You get it from most of the local bookstores, and you can certainly get it from Amazon. And if you are listening to this on audio, uh, I made some Bitly links very easy. Okay, if you would like to buy the book uh, from Amazon. Uh, you can go to bit.ly, all lowercase, safely to earth. And if you would like the audio book, it can go to bit.ly, safe earth. Okay? Okay. And do this. You have got to read this book. Or listen to it, read it, have it read to you. Uh, if you know Jack personally, he'll recall it. He'll read it to you. Okay? <laughs> just just uh, call small, him. A small him. fee. Small fee. Right. Um, <laughs> so... Um, Let's get Jack. I, I can tell you right now, I did see in the room that we made at least two sales. All right. So two sales. Oh, fantastic. Good. We're doing right. our part, buddy. We're doing Thank our you. part. I appreciate that very much. All right. So so you know, usually you say this about people in the military, but we all that so many of us serve this nation in different ways. Mm -hmm. Right. You don't have to just be in the military. Jack, thank you for your service. It, thank you. Really. Thank yeah. you very much. I Indeed. Thank that. you. Good one, Pete. That was not an easy job. <laughs> to say the least. Not not, not with a slide roll. No. Well, it didn't right. do it because it was easy. That's no, right. you did it <laughs> because it, it was hard. hard. No, that's good. No, you felt the calling. That is awesome. That is, that is honestly, that's my favorite thing. Is that you, you? This was a calling for you. This wasn't just something like oh, I'll do this to make good money and blah blah blah. No, this was a calling for you. Yes, it was. So that's that's awesome. Yes, it was. And thank you. All right, let's wrap this thing up here, Michael. Here we go. You've just enjoyed another awesome episode of the Mythswits. This was really an awesome episode of the Mythswits. Uh, we're live on Facebook Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Please ask our guests questions just like some of the folks did in the room tonight, and we will answer them if we can. Or just banter with the other Mythfits, much like Paul Noons does. Uh, <laughs> if you miss our live show, you can always catch the Encore episodes on Facebook or on YouTube. Find us on Facebook and Twitter as Mythwits and check out Mythwits.com. If you don't have time for videos, make sure to subscribe to our podcast via your favorite, favorite podcatcher. Listen to it in your car! Put your earphones in! Um, Mythwits is part of the TSR Podcast Network. Check out TSRPN.com for more cool shows. Uh, it's a Creative Commons product. Like and share it in all the places. Just don't edit it. Don't sell it. And hey, make sure to switch SCE -S -S -E to AUX if it shuts down unexpectedly. Make sure to check out Aetherforge.com for more cool stuff to join our mailing list. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And until next week, Mike? Okay. Denise Clemens, I am looking right at you right now. Okay? Jack had his moment. 
He had his moment in the sun. He's done. It's old <laughs> news. Now it's done. All right. Everyone's been safely back to earth. But you know what we need to do? We need to write a book. You and I are going to sit down and we're going to write a book. I don't know. Maybe about astronaut food. What do you say? All right. That's it. <laughs>